Now, everybody's arguing about AI, and some people think it's taken on a life of its own, this kind of sinister personal character that the machine seems to have. And some people think there's nothing in that. It's all just gears and diodes, ones and zeros, numbers and code. And I am like that little girl in the GIF that people sometimes post where she looks kind of winningly at the camera and just says, why can't we have both? All right, we're talking here about allegregors, which is a word I made up. I really, literally am just making up words now, and I'm quite proud of this one. And allegregor describes a uniquely modern situation where the allegorical way you have of talking about a machine or a force of nature or a scientific fact starts to become more real than the materialist explanation of that thing. So last week, my primary example was Mother Nature. Everybody talks about Mother Nature as if they're speaking allegorically. If you asked your average Mother Nature respecter whether he was talking about an actual person with thoughts and ideas and desires, probably you would get an answer something like, no, what are you dumb? I'm using this metaphorical language, but what I really mean is the ecosystem or the environment. And yet, this allegorical way of thinking and talking starts to take over our speech so much that the allegory becomes more true and a more accurate description of how we are seeing the world than the supposedly underlying literal materialist explanation of things. And so that's the example I gave last week. This week, I want to talk about another allegor, and that is AI, artificial intelligence, which has obviously been in the news a bunch lately, and it, we're talking mostly here, I think, when we when we say AI, I think what people jump immediately to is technically the large language model, and that's what's behind something like ChatGPT, where you type in a question or you give it a PDF and you ask it to analyze some feature of it, and it spits out this increasingly eerily human-looking kind of answer about all the different thoughts it supposedly has, or at least all the information it can tell you and synthesize about this stuff. And, you know, Apple is obviously incorporating this into its product, so is Google. You're starting to see it show up in different search engines and so forth, and it makes some very laughable mistakes. It's clumsy, it blunders in all these funny ways, but it's also really uncanny in the way that it can kind of ape and mimic human speech, human action, and some would even say human thought. There's a very long-standing idea that goes back at least to 1950 with Alan Turing's paper on the subject, but I'm going to argue today it's much older than this, that if something can convincingly mimic a human being, then for all intents and purposes, it is thinking or having the same kind of status as a human being that thinks and has a consciousness and experience of the world. And at least structurally speaking, at least in terms of what we mean when we say consciousness, this is plainly untrue. We don't actually believe that a mathematical equation, which is what a large language model is, a very, very complex set of mathematical equations, doesn't have experiences, doesn't have thoughts. It can only give off the impression of having thoughts. And because these equations are so complex, they're effectively probability functions, like the kind that fills in predictive text on your iPhone, because they're so complex that we don't even actually know what's going on inside this big black box of equations. It has a feature that makes it self-correcting, essentially, which means that it can kind of try out different ways of predicting the next word and get better and better as it chews through all of this data from the internet. And one of the major talking points here is just what kind of information, what kind of raw material are we scraping off the internet to feed feed into this machine so that it can learn more and more convincingly what human thought and the products of human thought look like. And we now talk about these machines as if they were conscious entities, sometimes as if they were people, but often even as if they were something more than people. You'll hear a common refrain about AI is, we are building God. And there are 
people on the fringes that think this is literal, that the AI does actually think and have a conscious experience and have a way of relating to the world. You found, for example, there was a Google engineer, I think his name was Blake Lemoyne, who published a big, big medium post about his interactions with Google's version of, of AI. That There is that dimension of things, just like there are real believers in Mother Nature as a full-on conscious entity. But most of the time, I think, if you asked, say, Elon Musk, who does sometimes play with this we're building God kind of talk, I think he would say, not in the way that we literally imagine when we talk about traditional religion. I don't think Elon imagines himself to be saying, like, there is an entity with a consciousness that is active in this AI world that is taking over the power of the universe and can reconstruct reality and all this stuff in, in a purposeful or intentional way. I think pe people who are sophisticated about this stuff know that we're not dealing with the same kind of consciousness that we human beings have. And yet, and yet, this is how allegregors get made. Remember that uh, the original impulse here, way going back to the beginning of the scientific revolution, the original impulse behind all of our technological feats of wonderment was that we were going to get at the actual reality that the pagan myths, the Greek myths and even the Egyptian myths and the Babylonian myths, those myths described some reality in an allegorical sense and science was supposed to give you the real deal. That's what science and technology have always been. It was possible to imagine that that project would work when there was a god outside of nature that deserved our final and ultimate worship. Now that people don't believe in that so much anymore, the impulse to worship, the impulse to believe in conscious entities outside of ourselves and above ourselves has to go somewhere because that is part of our experience of the world. And I've been arguing it's going into these allegregors. It's making its way into this sort of roundabout form of worship that we, that we perform. And AI is one of the most fascinating and complex and psychologically nuanced examples of this, that even as we know exactly what we're doing, even as we understand that we make these things, human beings create these programs, and even as we know that, though we can't describe exactly how the program works, we know at a high conceptual level what it is. We've understood what these so-called neurons, not the brain kind, but the form of programming that's named after the neuron. We know what these are and how they work. You can read textbooks on them. I, for my sins, have dabbled in a little bit of the mechanics of this, though I'm no programmer myself. So even somebody like me that's relatively amateurish can get kind of a grasp of how these kind of word embeddings work. You can do the same with the visual stuff, with the mid journeys and, and so on and so forth. Even though we know exactly what we're doing, we still can't seem to help talking about these machines as if they were coming alive, as if they were spiritual entities. Sometimes we think we've found demons in them. There's all sorts of examples of these what are called cryptids where people will think they've discovered a kind of freestanding autonomous entity that moves through the AI. Sometimes we just think that the AI itself is a kind of soul or a kind of spirit. And we talk about this stuff and we talk about what the AI is going to do to us and how it's going to take over the world or trick us or whatever, as if this product of our own making has detached from us and taken on a life of its own. And even if we would say that that's an allegory, that that's not real, that that's only a metaphorical way of speaking, still, in this allegorical kind of way, it seems to take on a life of its own. So I want to talk today about how that works, where that comes from, and I'm going to keep doing this allegor these allegorgores for a while now because you guys have been sending in some examples of them that I want to get into. I thank you for sending them. Please keep them coming if you've got ideas or examples of how these allegorgores are showing up in our world and how pagan worship is kind of making its way back or modes of pagan worship are making their way back into our thinking. Very interested to hear about them. But let's start now in with AI and with the creation of a mechanical mind, which is a very, very old idea. 
But first, summer is in full swing, and that means it's time for you, and I do mean you, to go and sign up for the Ancient Language Institute's fall courses. The deadline to do this is August 10th, and you don't want to miss it. In fact, I would suggest doing it earlier than that because these courses do fill up and they are well, well worth your time. I really can't think of a single person that listens to this show and enjoys this show who wouldn't get something out of the Ancient Language Institute's courses. What they do is they teach the ancient languages, and those include now Biblical Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and Old English, which is something we've spent some time talking about lately on the show. And they will teach you each of these languages no matter where you are as a starting point. If you have some of these languages, if you have some modern languages but you've never studied an ancient language, if you've never studied a language at all, they have a course level to meet your needs. And they will teach you in a highly intuitive sort of way so that you're not just confronted with this mound of sort of disconnected declensions and conjugations off the bat, but are rather reading original texts in the original language very early on. This is how we learn languages more generally. We don't tend to do it with ancient languages because we think of them as like these abstract dead things rather than real life ways of communicating. And yet that is exactly what they are. And the Ancient Language Institute's way of teaching them gets you an intuitive grasp of that very early on so that you can start to encounter the authors that we talk about and love on this show. Authors like Virgil, the biblical sources, the biblical texts, Beowulf, so on and so forth, in this really direct and immediate way, as if they were living texts, which they are once you get a handle on these languages. So here's what you got to do to sign up. You go to ancientlanguage.com slash heretics. I will drop the link in the description of this episode, ancientlanguage.com slash heretics to sign up. And when you are listening to my voice, and only when you are listening to my voice, you have the secret code, which is just my name, S-P-E-N-C-E-R, that you can put in at checkout and get 10% off your fees. So it's S-P-E-N-C-E-R, Spencer, for registration. That's only for listeners of Young Heretics. And the link to go to is uh, ancientlanguage.com slash Young Heretics. Go check it out. So artificial intelligence, mechanical gods, mechanical demons. The first thing we have to understand here is how deep this goes in our psychology. This is one of these things that seems very new, very modern, very trendy, but actually responds to a pretty primal urge that we have, or a primal set of thoughts and fears that we've been chewing on for as long as there is a record of human thought. And this was true in the case of Mother Nature. I talked about Maga, Mother Mother Earth, Mother Nature, Pachamama, these sort of universal attestations to the fact that we've always had an encounter of the world as mother, an encounter of nature as mother. And in much the same way, we have always been darkly fascinated with the idea that we or somebody could create machines that act like people or like thinking beings. And the first instance of this that I could come up with is, in fact, in Homer, who is often our earliest Greek source for something because he is our earliest Greek poet. And in Homer, there is a series of passages, actually, not just one passage, but a number of places where Almost any time we meet the god Hephaestus, who is the god of metalworking and craftsmanship and armor making and so forth, any time we meet Hephaestus, he has some kind of creation or contraption that works on its own without anybody having to push a button or manipulate this object. The Greeks from very early on in their earliest poetry had this idea that if you could create something so skillfully that it was almost godlike, then it wouldn't need your input anymore. It would break apart from you and gain a kind of life of its own. And the word that Homer uses for this is automatos, which you will recognize as our word automaton. And automaton is a Greek word. Autos in Greek means self. And so automatos or automatic means self-moving, moving on its own volition of its own accord, its own impulse. And this comes first in the Iliad book 
5, we get this description of, of gates that are self-bidden or automata, that move automatically. They've grown upon their hinges, and these are the gates of heaven, which the hours have in their keeping. That's Iliad Book 5. So if you have ever wanted an illustration of the wholesale craftsmanship of the Iliad as a complete poem, tracing an idea like the automatic craftsmanship of Hephaestus through the development of the poem is a great way to get a feel for how this couldn't just be a bunch of random oral performances stitched together. Yes, I think it did begin, this poem did begin as a sung performance, and perhaps it was, there are elements of it that are older than others, but this idea that emerged kind of in the 19th century that this might just be a sort of pastiche, like a, you know, quilt of randomly assorted popular songs simply has never been able to hold water because of the extremely subtle effects that you can find as you work through the poem. Because what happens here is we get this like, this concept introduced in book five, that there are these gates that can move on their own, that have sort of self-driving powers, right? Um, and you might think of automatic doors, right? Which we now have basically any like office building has an automatic door that opens when you approach it. The uh, poet of the Iliad, Homer, was thinking about this long, long in advance. It, it's always been kind of a, a vision. We now live literally in the dream of the Greeks in this respect. And that dream, as the poem continues, starts to develop. And each time we encounter it, it has a new element added in. So in book 18, here we find Hephaestus at his bellows. He's working in his forge. He's the god at work, and he's sweating. It's a really detailed picture as he moves back and forth. Hephaestus is this lame god. That is, he has legs that don't work because he was hurled off Mount Olympus as a child, but he has these incredibly brawny, this brawny upper body, right? So he never skips push or pull day. He never skips the bench press, but unfortunately he's mandated, he's sort of forced to skip leg day by his disability. And so he's moving back and forth, sweating with the effort, moving back and forth from his bellows. He's creating tripods, and tripods are a kind of container, of a ritual vessel for wine or other fluids with three feet to them, right? Tripod means three legs. And this is the most important thing. They stand around the wall of his well-built hall, and he set golden wheels beneath the base of each that by themselves, of their own accord, they might enter the gathering of the gods. And this word automa automata, the, the, the tripods are automata, which is the plural form of automatos. Um, they can go whenever he wants, so he has command of them, but they do it on their own. So this is like a Roomba, right? You've got basically these tripod Roombas that move when you tell them to, but know where to go and how to go. And they are wondrous. They're a wonder to behold, naturally, because, of course, there's nothing like this in real life in the Homeric era in, say, the 8th century BC, but we're imagining this in the same way that we're imagining automatic doors. We've got the automatic doors at the gates of heaven. We've got the Roomba tripods who show up again in book 18. And then a little bit later, also in book 18, we've got even one step further in this direction of the automatic craftsmanship, and that is these slave girls, essentially, that have minds of their own. So from sort of simple devices like gates that move automatically, we've got slightly more complex devices that can make their way around without being told the route that have a, like a certain degree of programming to them and now we've got fully autonomous self-driving vehicles and this is these slave girls that move swiftly to support their lord because remember Hephaestus is lame right so he needs these assistants and he's made machines to do this for him they and Homer goes out of his way to emphasize that in their hearts, they have understanding and in then speech and strength. So there is now a claim about the inward state of these machines that have been programmed to act in a certain way, but their programming is so advanced, so developed, that they now have minds of their own. And so this is almost contained within 
the progression from book five to book 18 of the Iliad and in within the forge of Hephaestus, there is an entire little encapsulation of the development of thought that leads people to imagine that machines might one day develop a life of their own, that they might become truly automatos, that is self-moving in the absolute sense of making choices and of having thoughts that direct them in certain ways. So at least the vision, that picture, that idea, has always been kind of present to haunt the Western mind, and the whole logic of it is contained already in Homer. There's also in the Odyssey, by the way, there are self-driving ships, so if the robots that help Hephaestus are sort of like the AI digital assistant, I mean, maybe they're the robot that like makes your coffee in the morning and whatever, there are also self-driving cars, but they're their ships because that's how people got around. And this is the Phaeacians who are these sort of semi-mythological, semi-legendary sailors that have self-steering ships uh, that don't need oars, they don't have, need pilots, they just go and they kind of communicate directly with the thoughts of men. So maybe, I don't know, there's Neuralink or something between the, the Phaeacians and their ships. But this is in book eight of the Odyssey. So you can go look up these passages, but each one of them kind of gives us an element of this thought process that we are now staring directly in the face. This is understood to be a divine power. And there are other examples of it throughout the classical world. Daedalus is somebody, the mythological sort of craftsman who built the uh, labyrinth for the Minotaur, most famous perhaps for making wings so that he and his son Icarus could fly, but Icarus flew too close to the sun and so forth. Daedalus is often described as having made creatures that needed to be constrained, held down, because they would otherwise move of their own accord, right? But the idea is associated with, if not being a god, then having a kind of divine gift, as, as Daedalus did. It is also, from the beginning, an unnerving and perhaps even sinister kind of thing. And Francis Bacon, who we met a while ago, because he has all of these kind of modern interpretations of the Greek myths, Francis Bacon associates Daedalus with evil craftsmanship, with the dark side of technology and of making things. And he says that there's a number, number of reasons for this, but one of them is the simulation, the aspect of kind of pretending or faking a, an effect that mimics something real, but doesn't actually get at the heart of things. And so this is where, in the modern era, we start to see this anxiety reemerge that something might be so precisely programmed and so complex in its specifications, some machine might be so intricately worked that it can give off the impression, the false impression, of being automatos in the way that we are automatos, because we human beings are definitely self-moved. We sort of know this, even though there are all these debates over free will. One of the things I've stressed again and again on the show is that we have this very strong, powerful, felt sense, even if we can't explain it philosophically, we have this very strong sense that we are the originators of our own movement. This is also ancient and primal, and it's a necessary ingredient of how we understand ourselves as entities, that we can make our own choices. And if it is the case that you could program something so deftly that it looks like it was making its own choices, then you have raised the very terrifying possibility that we only look like we are making our own choices when in fact we are programmed. And that is why anxieties about artificial intelligence Thoughts about machines that can work on their own are always mirror images of anxieties about ourselves. The reason that we are so worried about AI is not because we think it might be thinking, but because we're worried that we're not thinking. We have this fear that, in fact, we are just the same as these machines. And so AI is always a mirror for ourselves, and it has been from the beginning, from the sort of earliest days of thought about this, it's been a question of what it would take for something to look self-motivated, automatos, automatic. And this is something that Bacon writes about when he talks about Vulcan in the, his book, The Advancement of Learning, which is from 1605, so slightly earlier than the other one that I was reading to you from last week. But he Bacon writes, 
leaving divine philosophy or natural theology, we proceed to natural philosophy. If it be true that Democritus said that the truth of nature lieth hid in certain deep mines and caves, and if it be true likewise that the alchemists do so much inculcate that Vulcan is a second nature, and imitateth that dexterously and compendiously which nature worketh by ambages and length of time, it were good to divide natural philosophy into the mine and the furnace. So he's saying here in kind of twisty, torturous ways that there are two branches of natural philosophy, one of which is to understand the secret workings of nature. And that's represented by Democritus and by the mines and by the deep caves that we kind of find our way into as we think our way down to the bedrock of reality. And the other side of this is to imitate and reproduce the effects that nature produces. So if one kind of philosophy is about getting under the skin and understanding what's really going on underneath, the other kind is about imitating and reproducing the outward effects of what those underlying truths create. So one is about causes underneath, and one is about effects, and that's Vulcan. Vulcan is the furnace, the artificer, the maker of machines, who creates these sort of things that look as if they are the way nature has made them. And, and he does it much more quickly than nature, because nature gradually and organically over time sort of gives rise to these things. Vulcan just creates them, right? Makes these reproductions of them. And sometimes they are real and sometimes they are fake, but the fake ones are perhaps the ones that give us most pause, right? That, that terrify us most because they suggest that maybe all this underlying cause stuff is really just secondary, is sort of accidental. And that is precisely what people are now saying about AI. They'll say, well, just because you generate words and actions and ideas through this organic, fleshy process that has to do with your experience of the world and your consciousness, why should that be any different than a machine that generates the exact same things through a mindless series of equations and sort of moving parts or even just ones and zeros. And the only answer to that has to do with the inward experience, it has to do with your conscious experience of not simply putting out words, but actually having an, a, an impression of the world and describing that impression with words. And if that inner life is only an illusion or it's irrelevant or it's secondary, then there is no difference between you and a machine that matters. There's a major difference in what's going on under the hood. But Vulcan, that is Hephaestus, that is this sort of spirit of the artificer and the engineer, calls into question whether it matters what's going on under the hood. And for exactly this reason, you will find, if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary and you look up the history of the modern English word automaton, you will find two major veins of meaning. And they're almost exactly opposite from one another. The first one is that the automaton represents something which has all these hidden gears working inside it so that it can produce a perfect machine system that looks as if it is sort of spontaneous, but actually has all these hidden underlying causes. This would be Bacon's kind of Democritus caves, right? And so, for example, Henry Moore, who's one of what's called the Cambridge Platonists and in 1660, writes that writes about the great automaton of the universe because God is this mechanical craftsman. He's made the world work in all these secret ways and nature works in all these interlocking ways. And nature, which is, in fact, ultimately a machine, which has these you know mechanical processes going on within it, nevertheless looks like this wonderful unity that has you know kind of perfection hanging together. So that's sort of one version of the automaton idea. But then... As we sort of, if you scroll through this Oxford English Dictionary series of examples, you also get cases in which automaton means almost the opposite of this. And in other words, means something that just does 
have free will, that moves itself, right? That is automatos. And in one article from Palladium, we get man is the only true automaton or self-mover. In other words, we actually do have this light of consciousness inside of us that doesn't boil down into some underlying machinery that has its causes input into it from outside, but actually generates its own source of motion within. And the contrast between these two kinds of automaton, the truly free self-mover, and the intricately designed but actually mechanical automaton is, is present in our language, right? And starts to call into question whether there is a difference between these two things or not. And that's what science fiction is always about when it talks about automata, right? When we talk, start to talk about robots and consciousness, if you think of data from Star Trek, right? And all the questions in Star Trek about whether he really has a soul or human rights or is a person or whatever... All of that is about whether this series of gears and diodes that looks as if it thinks can be the same as a thing which actually thinks. And the mechanical philosophy, the sort of excess of scientific fervor that starts to take hold in the 17th century, has always sort of leaned toward the idea that really at bottom, at base, there is no difference between these things. That what produces the impression of thought and free will in us is basically just a series of springs and gears and parts moving up against each other. And so if we could create a complex system of springs and gears and parts moving up against each other that looked like it was thinking. We would have done the same thing that God did or that Hephaestus did when he created these supposedly divine entities. And this would make us like gods. It would make us able at least to create in the same way that gods create. Of course, however, it would also make us into machines because at the same time we were creating machines that act like us, we would also be confirming our fear or suspicion that we who act like us are just machines. And you get this from very early on. Here's Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan, somebody that's not often cited as an exemplar of the mechanical philosophy, but who does begin his 1651 political theory treatise with this very interesting reflection on the idea of the artificial man, which for him is the government. The government's an artificial man. But he says, Nature, the art whereby God hath made and governs the world, is by the art of man, as in many other things, so in this also imitated, that it can make an artificial animal. So for Hobbes, mankind's ability to create political structures is in some way the image in him of God's ability to create the world. How is this? Well, he goes on, life is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is in some principal part wherein. Why may we not say that all automata, engines that move themselves by springs and wheels, as doth a watch, have an artificial life? For what is the heart but a spring, and the nerves but so many strings, and the joints but so many wheels giving motion to the whole body, such as was intended by the artificer. And so Hobbes is laying it out on the table, saying the quiet part out loud. This has been present and kind of implicit in our way of thinking about our machines for a long time. Now, because we have this new mechanical philosophy and because we have this ambition to turn the pagan myths into physical material reality, we can start to suggest that maybe what we are is something that we could recreate in physical, mechanical form. And this idea, the kind of man-machine gets going in the 1600s, but obviously it has not gone away because with the advent of computers and now with AI, you have very much the very much real possibility that we can make a machine that convincingly imitates or produces the outward effect, the same outward effect as our consciousness produces within us. And this is why we're always, when we're talking about AI, talking about a mirror world. We're talking about looking into a mirror of our own creation that looks like us, maybe walks like us, maybe talks like us, but isn't on the inside 
anything like us. And this calls into question whether we really are what we think we are on the inside. In other words, is the fact that we have this subjective experience of the world essential to what we are? Or can something that doesn't have that subjective experience, that isn't built like us at all, but nevertheless is built, right, is produced to have these sort of automatic reactions to things, can that be the same as us in some essential way? Why does this cause us such fear and such anxiety? Well, if you really think about it, the idea of an automatic machine is actually a contradiction in terms, in some profound sense. Because as I've been saying, right, automatic means self-moved. Machine, which is also a Greek word, mechane, means a contrivance that is designed to respond in certain ways with certain outputs to certain inputs. And if you're responding mechanically to inputs with predetermined outputs, then you are not self-moved, you are not automatic, but you are actually determined. You are locked into a chain of external cause and effect. And that's the fear that we're up against when we talk about AI is we're looking at something that we know has a predetermined set of rules about cause and effect. They're based on probability. They're not based on absolute determinism. But nevertheless, they are scripted because we tell them in general how to script themselves. And then they refine those scripts on their own because part of the script is an iterative self-refinement mechanism. And since they have that mechanism in them, we know that they are machines, but they look automatic. They look, in other words, self-governed, self-driven, self-directed, just like Hephaestus robots seem to have inner understanding. And Homer goes so far as to say that they do because he's imagining a god who can actually put that, who actually understands the mechanics of self-understanding and motion and, and, motion and ideas that come spontaneously from, from you. The question is whether a machine that gives the impression of being automatic is the same as us who have the impression of feeling automatic. We feel automatic. We have this impression when I go out into the world, I think and feel that I am making my own choices, having my own experiences, making my own decisions. But there has been a suggestion for a very long time in our philosophy and in our thought that what's actually going on underneath that impression of being automatic is actually just machinery, is just a predetermined set of inputs and outputs. In us, it's biological. It has to do with our neurons and our electricity and our chemistry and so forth. And if that's correct, then our machines really are just us by another route. And that is exactly what Alan Turing argued in his famous 1950 paper, which is called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, which you can find for free online, and which puts forward what now is known as the Turing test. The Turing test is this idea that if you could put a machine basically in a black box and a human in a black box and then another human to test both the other human and the machine with questions and answers, the machine would be thinking for all intents and purposes when it could fool the human or when the human couldn't tell the difference between a machine and another human being. And later down the line in the paper, Turing addresses this argument, which he calls the argument from consciousness, that machines aren't conscious and therefore they can't think. And he quotes this guy, Professor Jefferson Lister in, in a speech where he says, no machine can write a sonnet or compose a concerto because of thoughts and emotions felt and not by the chance fall of symbols. And this is exactly what we are looking at when we look at AI. We're looking at something which by the chance fall of symbols is able to produce what we recognize as a sonnet. It's not thinking and feeling, I have this experience, let me put it into words. It is instead producing the outward form of a sonnet through a series of very complicated inputs and outputs. This argument, writes Turing, appears to be a denial of the validity of our test. According to the most extreme form of this view, the only way by which one could be sure that a machine thinks is to be the machine and feel oneself thinking. One could then describe these feelings to the world, but of course no one would be justified in taking any notice. Likewise, according to this view, the only way to know a man thinks is to be that particular man. But instead of arguing continually over this point, it is usual to have the polite convention that everyone thinks. 
The reason why this is such a famous article and idea is not just because Turing basically is the architect of modern computing. And it's not just because Turing was right about this. I think he was dramatically wrong. I think the opposite of what he's saying is true. But the reason why his paper is so powerful is because it touches on this nerve, plays on this anxiety that has been running through Western history and Western thought, at least since Homer. That if we could build a machine that mimicked our behavior, but didn't have an inner life, then we might not have an inner life, even though we feel like we do, and even though we behave as if we do. And now we seem to be on the verge of creating machines that do behave as if we do. And the only way we can distinguish ourselves from that machine is by insisting that our conscious experience of the world isn't actually capable of being boiled down to a series of inputs and outputs. And it's very possible to make that assertion if you're committed to it as a philosophical principle. Because, of course, none of the inputs and outputs, none of the equations that I've been talking about, none of the premises of AI suggest anything like an explanation for what it is like to be me. And that what it is like to be me, the actual experience of being a human being, is not explained by any of our material descriptions of what happens when we have that experience. I can give you a mathematical description of what happens when AI puts out its various answers to your questions. I can give you even a rough biochemical description of what happens when I have the experience of stubbing my toe, let's say. But neither of those experiences comes close even to touching the quality of the pain of my toe when I stub it, right? That pain isn't actually related in any discernible way to any of this mechanical stuff that we can say either about ourselves or about our machines. And that qualitative reality is in fact what the scriptural tradition insists on as the indispensable ingredient of creation that makes it move. That is why it's so crucial that unlike in the pagan mythologies, the book of Genesis and the Jewish tradition and then the Christian tradition describes a conscious mind making choices about the whole of creation and then working those choices out in the particulars. And there's this really eerie sort of effect that you get here where, you know, AI is okay at doing an impression of a human being at this point. We're really still kind of in rudimentary days and it makes a lot of mistakes and you get these hallucinations and funny errors that it'll spit out that definitely make it possible to tell the difference between a human product and AI still. I'm sure this will change as we go along and as the tech gets more advanced, but you still get all sorts of hilarious stuff. And even the visuals, like, you know, they look very beautiful a lot of the time, but somebody like me who's not all that trained in visual art or interested in visual art even, even I can still see that what it's basically doing is recreating very advanced CGI, which is fine, but it's not the pinnacle of what humans are capable of creating. If you go back and watch classic cinema before CGI, there's a lot of stuff in there that I still think AI can't really reproduce, at least yet. So there's some glitches and errors and stutter steps when it tries to imitate human being. If you wanted to imitate God, I mean, it's neither omniscient nor omnipotent, so there's lots of reasons why it wouldn't do a convincing impression of a God. But AI is really, really good at doing an impression of a demon. Like, if you look up Loab or one of these cryptids that I've written about, you find that it behaves in much the same ways that the classic descriptions of demons tend to behave, like mostly through the power of suggestion, it's sort of this spirit of the air with no physical body that nevertheless kind of worms its way into your mind. There's something very spooky about the similarities between AI and classical demonology, not necessarily going out to say here that all AI is demonic or anything, but just that if you think about what demons actually are in our traditional understanding, one of the major concepts behind demonology is from Augustine that what is evil has no being in itself, but can only contort what 
exists, which is good, as a kind of parasite on the good, that it warps or distorts or rips open this this negative space in existence, which is itself inherently good. And so if you think about that, like, demons are kind of this creation of the interaction between negative space and the human mind when the human mind imputes an entity to negative space or a consciousness to negative space which is exactly what we're doing when we talk about AI as if it were alive right we're taking this thing that is a black void on the inside and we're layering onto it this external appearance of consciousness that we give a certain life to. And that is why what we're really up against here is a case in, a, in the deep sense of idolatry. Not idolatry in the kind of cheap way we tend to talk about, oh, you've made an idol out of your romantic partner, but this deep psychological core function of idolatry, which is layering on the belief of consciousness to what really only has the appearance of consciousness on the outside and inside is a kind of black box. Idols and demons are the same thing in exactly this way, and that is also what we make out of AI when we reduce our own selves to machines and then elevate our machines to the status of humans or gods. And the opposite view of that, which is that if you can recreate this set of appearances using sort of material means, then you have recreated an entity, is what the scriptural tradition defines as idolatry. To carve something out of wood or metal or stone that looks like a human being or looks like a supernatural being, and then to impute the identity, the, the identity of humanity or the identity of divinity to that entity is what we call idolatry. Carving a statue, calling it a god, making a program, calling it a god, calling it a human is a form of idolatry. And the reason the Bible defines this as the sort of central sin is not because of what it says about the machine or the rock or the sculpture or the statue or whatever, but because of what you are saying about yourself when you make that assertion, which is that your consciousness, the qualitative subjective reality of your consciousness is irrelevant to the essence of what you are. And Famously, therefore, in Psalm 115, what we learn is that those who make idols become like them. We toss this off as a kind of Christian slogan, and we think of it as something we can like pound our fists about in church, but it is in fact an extraordinarily profound assertion about how this psychological mechanism works because the authors of the Bible were watching the pagans do it all around them. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, whatever, were all saying this about their gods. And here's what Psalm 115 says. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. In other words, they have the outward form of consciousness, just like AI does. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet, but they speak. Feet, but they walk not. And neither speak they with their throat. But they that make them shall be like unto them. Yea, everyone that trusteth in them. If you believe in, trust in AI to be meaningfully human, then you become a form of AI because there's no meaningful difference between you and AI if AI can really perfectly mimic the appearance of humanity except for the qualitative experience of the world that you have, that God has imbued in you as part of your image of him, right? You are the image of God in exactly this way, that you are automatos in the true sense of the word, that is uh, independent, that is uh, autonomous, right? Able to move of your own accord, which AI is not, even though we have so obscured the pathways that lead from cause to effect that it's able to look that way. Now we understand why our description of AI as a kind of god or as a kind of entity or even sometimes a demon, you might find cryptids in AI, like Loab, if you're familiar with this AI demon, right? Those descriptions have turned into allegregors. That is, they seem metaphorical, but they're actually real expressions of what we're starting to believe about our machines because without a god outside of nature who inputs into us free will, conscious experience, subjective reality, without 
any sort of mechanical impulse. Unless that's true, then there really is no difference between us and our machines. And so when we're looking at AI allegorically, calling it a god, calling it a demon, what we're really doing is we're looking in the mirror. And it's right there in Psalm 115. It's exactly what the pagans believed could happen to their machines because as pagans, they had no god outside of nature that could was capable of creating a truly autonomous being that was not, at the same time, a machine. Okay, I have so much more to say about allegorgors and AI and automata and so forth, but I hope this was a useful primer. Uh, this was a particularly fun one for me to do. Would love to get your thoughts about it and would also love to hear from you about other allegorgors. I've got a few now in my inbox that I do want to do episodes on, I know. But keep them coming. Let me know what you think. Let us do the mailbag. Mailbag questions come to me on Substack. So I have a Substack called rejoiceevermore.substack.com. We have just passed the threshold of 10,000 subscribers, which on Substack is awesome. That is so wonderful that you guys are there reading my work. As a celebration, I've dropped a little 10% discount through the rest of the month. So if you want to sign up to be a paid subscriber, you can do that this month only for 10% off for a year, just as a thank you to all of you for listening, for watching, for reading, for any kind of engagement you want to offer. I really love hearing your thoughts and, and being in contact with you. Um, I will drop the link to that in the description of this episode, so do sign up if you like. But both free and paid subscribers are able to DM me or email me with questions that you've got. This week's question is one of my favorite genres of question, and people write in with these from time to time, but uh, I love answering them. And this is a writing advice question. So writing is really the thing that I think of as most central to my own craft. It's where I am most blissful. It's what I love to do most. But you don't have to be a professional writer in order to care about writing or to try out writing. It'll make you a better reader because you'll understand what the challenges are of writing. And it will also hone your mind if you're just writing in your journal or if you're writing a response to something that you've experienced or even just writing a letter, cultivating the art of writing a really good letter to a friend. Rob doesn't say what he's working on, so I can't be sure, but I think his question will be relevant no matter what you're up to. And he, it's this. He says, do you have any advice on writing when the project you're working on seems to fight back? I try to write for almost about an hour most days. Sometimes I get an easy 1,000 words. Other days it's 200 to 300 and every word felt like a battle to put on the page. Well, everybody feels this way, Rob, first of all. This is not unique to you. And even if you know a writer who always seems to come up with perfectly polished prose, I guarantee that he has good days and bad days and that the stuff you're seeing is the result of long labor and sometimes a lot of sweat and a lot of pain. Everybody has these experiences sometimes where you really just feel like you're grinding it out. And even when you do that, it's not working so well. So my first piece of advice for you is I think you were writing too much too quickly. Sometimes it's easy, you say, to get a thousand words in in an hour. That is a lot of words. I personally take four hours to write about 500 words. And that's not to say like, oh, we should be getting to a competition about how long it takes us to write, but simply that you might want to change your expectations because unrealistic expectations is one really great way to get into a rut really, really fast. If, if you think that you are always going to write a thousand words in an hour, to me that is like when truly a lightning strike descends from on high, the heavens open, the clouds part, and suddenly you are just a mouthpiece for God, right? That's like when you get a thousand words out in an hour, whereas 200 to 300 in an hour is m much more reasonable, and I would say moderate your expectations to that extent. Even so, even at a slower pace, it's going to sometimes feel like a slog. It's going to feel like a grind. And the first thing I have to say, which it sounds like you might already be doing, which is good, is something that I've heard attributed to Guy de Maupassant, who was a great short story writer, among other things. And I've never been able to really securely track this quotation, so it might be apocryphal, but it's a great quotation, whoever originally said it. And that is, put black on white. Black ink on white paper. It's workmanlike. Sometimes it feels uninspired. Sometimes it feels dull. You do it anyway. Just keep 
putting the work out. Sometimes inspiration will be there, sometimes not. I always say that discipline is the chariot you build for inspiration when it comes so that you can ride the inspiration when it does appear. You've got to be laying those planks down one by one every day, get up without fail and work and put black on white. It sounds like you might be doing that because you the fact that you're even having this problem suggests that you're kind of doing it right. But the last thing that I would say about this is to avoid a fear of uh, perfectionism, or rather the fears that come with perfectionism, where you feel like you're constantly editing as you go. There are times when you need to be meticulous and really insisting upon the right word for every instance, every mo moment, every notion, every flicker of sentiment. But usually those times don't come immediately. You have to sort of just put some stuff out there, get black on white. And you may surprise yourself when things get out in front of a reader. I find when I'm doing this podcast, which is not writing, but which is nevertheless a creative process, that sometimes when I think I'm really in flow and I'm just spitting fire, I look back and I listen again and I'm like, oh, that wasn't actually as good as it felt. And then sometimes when I feel like I'm really struggling to express myself and I'm not getting things across and I'm being kind of dull, I listen back and I'm like, oh, wait, this is a good section of the show. So your impression of the difficulty of putting stuff out is not always the same as the experience your reader or your listener is going to have when the final product hits the shelves. So put black on white, trust the process, build the chariot for inspiration, and then ride the inspiration when it comes. You're, it's perfectly normal. There's, you're not doing anything wrong. It doesn't mean you're bad or you've lost it or you've lost your skill. You just plow through it. Keep working. Sometimes you may need to moderate your expectations, and I, that's the only thing I would suggest you do differently is change what you expect yourself to produce in a given time frame because I think you've kind of overshot the mark on that. But otherwise, just keep trucking, man. It, 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 sometimes it comes, sometimes it doesn't. you got to keep putting black on white. All right, I have one last segment for you, and that is called I Maked This, where I like to tell you about something that I've created besides this podcast that you might find interesting. And this week, I'm going to point you to The American Mind, which is a really great website in general. I'm an editor there, and we publish a lot of stuff kind of from a right conservative perspective, but on a range of topics, and not always from the classic canonical you know, I, attitude that you might associate with the word conservatism. We tend to publish a range of more heterodox thinkers. Some of them are sympathetic leftists. Some of them are right-wingers, but not of the stripe that you're familiar with. And uh, that's one reason why I love working for the site. And it's another reason why I love writing for the site. My latest essay on there is called A Matter of Taste. And the basic argument here is if you want to talk about conservative culture, right-wing art, taking back the culture, whatever lingo you want to use for this sense that conservatives always have, that they're always losing the battle for the culture. Um, you have to understand that it's not just because the left is sinister and has taken over the world. It might also be because conservatives aren't always all that good at recognizing daring art and tolerating the funhouse madness that can come out of artists and art itself. There is a frenetic, a volatile, even a dangerous element to creativity that is bound to offend, and is that's part of what it does, that's part of what art does. In order to appreciate great art, you have to be ready to accept that, and you have to be ready to cultivate a little bit of taste in art. That's the argument I made on the American mind. It has caused a little bit of a stir online. There's been a lot of discussion on Twitter and elsewhere, which I've very much enjoyed. It's funny, usually when there's a capital D discourse going on, whether it's around something I've written or just in general in, on the interweb, I don't particularly enjoy the discourse all that much. It very quickly devolves into point scoring and sort of digital stuff, and I just like basically throw the piece out and then allow the fight to continue. But... Here I have really enjoyed mixing it up with smart people, talking back and forth about what conservative art even is and whether we should want it, and on and on. So I would be really interested to get you guys in on that discussion. One of the most interesting parts of it to me has been that a lot of people responded, not a lot of people, some people responded to the article by saying, but look at all this great right-wing art that I personally am making. 
which is interestingly not the point of the piece, right? The point is not about the idea that there is no good right-wing art or anything, because I think there is a lot of great conservative art. The response, the point was that listeners, watchers, readers, and critics on the right don't always respond rightly to good right-wing art, and which is a very, very different point, and I'd be interested to know your guys' thoughts on it. Uh, send me a DM, send me an email, whatever. I will drop the link to that article also in the description of this episode. Thank you so much for listening, for subscribing, for being a part of this wild journey. We'll talk more about Allegregors next week. Don't forget to rate, review, share, subscribe, do all the good stuff. Five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Uh, Share it on Twitter. DM it to your friends. Text your group chat. Tell your mom. Whatever. Just share the show. That really does help to grow the audience. And uh, thanks for being here. I'm very, very glad you are. Appreciate you a lot. I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.